Pillai for a nice and uh, well-timed talk. We move on now to the last talk of the session, which will be given by Professor G. Ravindra Kumar. He is a distinguished professor of nuclear and atomic physics department. Uh, is well known for his research on ultra short pulse and warm dense matter. He is an elected fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences and Indian National Science Academy. He was awarded Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize for his uh, uh, science and technology contributions in physical sciences in 2003. He is also a recipient of BM Birla Science Prize and Infosys Prize. So, Professor Ravindra Kumar. He's starting with a blank slide. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when do you want to uh, 40 minutes should be. Good morning. And uh, thank you for being here. Um, so this talk is not about a department. It's not about an activity. Uh, it, it's about lots of activities. And it was a huge challenge. Uh, for me, because uh, uh, it doesn't have, the way I saw it, a long history. And whatever history is there, I had to make my own version of the history. <laughs> and so this is, with due apologies, this is what I thought of this topic, uh, which is uh, listed, as you will see shortly. Uh, lots of things here are to tell you that this is a story of, at TIFR, of light uh, from fundamentals to extremes. I think at the end of it, I'll flash this slide again, and maybe you can see how much of justice has been made to whatever I uh, showed here, the different pieces that you have on your screen right now. So, um, well, this is, I think everybody says this, so I must say my piece. My motivations were to trace the evolution of activities, most importantly, people and events, right? And you will see how this evolution of people uh, through the, uh, the slides that I'll show you. And the thing was about searching for common themes. Since I said there's not one group activity, one a small activity in a department, uh, what was it that was common among all these things that we will talk about? And how did this happen? Uh, people separated across different groups, came together to make things happen. And what was that kind of, what drove them, what brought them together? Hopefully we'll capture some of that. And the caveats are of course that uh, this topic overlaps with several other things. Yesterday, Professor Hosu stole some of my thunder uh, by talking about what happened in chemistry uh, using light. Uh, but I think I'll give my own take on it. And so cannot cover everything because I, um, you know, uh, have my own limitations of what I understand of these uh, activities and the story is much briefer than the others because uh, it's not it is not like cosmic rays particle physics which started very early on but it's about four decades old so roughly about half the time uh, that we are celebrating half of 75 years and getting archival material proved a big challenge um, i gathered whatever i could and i put it together but uh, i wish i had got more and the apologies are, of course, because I just chose activities and probably caused a lot of offense. But, you know, I am sorry that if I missed out some things that need to be equally celebrated, but we cannot cover everything. And just, just to illustrate these things, I have picked up activities. So if you look at light, uh, you know, it's presumptuous to say for one person how the field has evolved, the entire field of optics, light, photonics has evolved. It's been uh, at least some of the major goals that we have had are to look at scales which are extraordinarily small, never thought of before, right? And at the same time, spread into larger and larger regions in, in a different scale. Maybe length scale, we are talking about extraordinarily small. Time, we talk of extraordinarily small. But on the other hand, the spectral region that we have covered uh, has just bloomed like anything. You know, we can now produce. Uh, we had traditionally microwave, radio, all these sources. There was a huge terahertz desert, and the desert has been blooming for the last uh, two decades or so, two or three decades, and more so in the recent past. And so we have covered, and now we go all the way up to hard X-rays. So the spectral region that we cover is enormous now. And 
So we have been trying to look at the fastest possible events, the smallest length scales that we can, and very, very fundamental processes. And um, also, as I said, what were considered barriers uh, early on have been overcome in the last two decades or so. So you have the diffraction limit, which has been broken. And I'll give you one example of that right here in at the AFR. And so this have actually the fact that we have broken the barriers have unleashed, this has unleashed so much of new discoveries, so many new things have happened that it's very difficult to capture. So this is my own take on how optics, so fast scales, large spectra, then um, uh, fast scales in uh, time, small scales in length, and in, um, huge leaps in fundamental science and imaging, which has also led to leaps in fundamental science. So there's been a major revolution in imaging, the way we see things, where they happen, as they happen, right? And so we can make sense of how these things are happening. So TIFR always did things differently. And that, I don't think I need to say it uh, louder in this room. Uh, while the rest of the country, IIT Kanpur started in the 60s with lasers, but they just went on uh, chasing this continuous wave laser, that continuous wave laser, building more lasers, doing frequency domain spectroscopy with them. But TFR chose to enter the ultra short domain. And as it turned out, um, well, it's fortunate that TFR can do all this that in the mid 80s, while the technology was still just becoming mature or accessible, uh, TIFR got the probably two systems of the state of the art ultra short lasers at that time, which were pico second duration. So let me tell you what fundamentals that we talk about. So this is a picture, uh, look at it carefully. I call this a historical event, right? 1987 Lonavla conference and Mahindra Jada was just referring to this in the morning uh, when I met him at, at the tea. And uh, this is several luminaries of the field who were already beginning to be luminaries and later became bigger luminaries here and elsewhere. Uh, people like Graham Fleming, who is a very famous chemist, ultra fast dynamics person, he's here. Uh, Robin Hochstrasser, I think, who is Sudip Tomaiti's advisor. Uh, uh, he is here, and several TFR people. Uh, I'd like you to particularly pay attention to Dorai here, whose picture I have not found separately, but he appears only in this picture. So all of them are standing, celebrating the ultra short conference uh, at Lonavla. And out came uh, two volumes of what was discussed at this meeting, uh, fast chemical processes in uh, molecular uh, state, free molecules or smaller systems, and then again in the condensed state. So what you see here, the pictures of the laser, you know, the kind of lasers that were available at that time, I think there's a CPM dye laser, colliding pulse mode lock dye laser, and then various decay scales here, which are all referring to something like nanosecond, sub nanosecond, uh, with the fastest detectors that they could access at that time. And the people uh, who made these things happen are all here, Balu, GK, uh, Ranjan Das, Sanjay, Periya Swami, and Dorai Swami, whose picture, solo picture I just could not find. I saw one picture of him uh, with the microwave setup yesterday. He actually came from microwaves to the uh, visible and infrared region. So that apologies to the, for that, but the rest of them are all here. And I'm glad to see GK is here. And Sanjay is busy with his daughter's wedding, as was mentioned yesterday. And... Uh, so what did, what happened in the 80s with these lasers? So again, basic processes about, you know, for example, you have molecular dynamics happening in a solvent, which is something that all chemists worry about all the time. And the fastest, what scales do these molecules actually move at? And this business of molecules rotating inside a liquid, how fast does it happen? What is it controlled by? Things like viscosity, right? And the orientational dynamics actually give you all this information. And I recall vaguely that they were talking about device Molochowski equation, um, how that can be verified with this and so on and so forth. And so this is, um, I think the papers, there were papers before that, but I just picked this up because this is a representative, it's a somewhat of a classic paper on the kind of work that was actually going on. And uh, again, diffusion control reactions, transient effects, and all these things were done by looking at the fluorescence that comes from these molecules as they tumble around inside the liquids. 
So controlling reaction, I mean, how these reactions happen and how the fluorescent signal gives you information on that. So I'm not an expert, but this is the kind of broad uh, thing that I get. And you look at the decay scale here, it's just about a few nanoseconds uh, for those who cannot see. And so this is ultra fast decay scales of fluorescence as given by uh, those times. And uh, in the 90s, Sanjay entered uh, chemical physics and he brought his own flavor. He started uh, this jet beam spectroscopy, supersonic jets, which actually cool the molecules so that you can look at the details of the, you know, uh, the substructures that you get in molecular spectroscopy. And as it turned out, he eventually branched out into looking at bond formation. You know, and I think Sanjay's major work has been on how the hydrogen bond manifests itself in different environments, the nature of the hydrogen bond itself. And in this, he has done a lot of work and on which he gave several colloquia at the Institute. So simply put, so this is gas phase spectroscopy, unconditional hydrogen bonds. I will not talk too much about it. I do not know much. But one of the things that Sanjay did was he also introduced things like, apart from fluorescence, ionization spectroscopy, resonance ionization, where you actually ionize the thing and pick the particles very, very cleanly, very, you can track them very, very uh, nicely. And um, so that and uh, that he did in something called resonance enhanced multiphoton ionization uh, with the nanosecond laser setup that along with the supersonic beams that he managed to set up in a small room. In fact, I recall that he actually converted a toilet, uh, part of the toilet, he actually took over into the lab in the B block uh, uh, first floor, the ground floor. And now as, as it turns out, that has gone back to being a toilet after Sanjay retired a couple of years ago. <laughs> so, um, and things were happening because people were talking. And that's again, another unique thing about TIFR that we talk, this one building, which brings lots of people together, makes them collide. Even if they don't like each other, they have to see each other. And sometimes the barriers can be overcome and good things happen, right? So these are people, of course, who are going very famously uh, across barriers also, you know, even geographical. This is GK's work um, sitting here, but collaborating very actively with uh, Jayant Udgaonkar at uh, TIFR and CBS. And I'm glad to see Swami is here. I told him I'll flash his name. So Swami, please put your hand up. And uh, so this is high profile work, which happened. Um, you know, you can look at the kind of things uh, buried tryptophan reveals the presence of partially structured forms during denaturation of bar star. And I think there's a lot of story about bar star that happened that GK can tell you. And all these techniques were because of fluorescence, resonance, energy transfer, something that they call fret, right? So a lot of fretting about uh, what happens in these systems. And the good thing about TIFR is also that you see Deepak Dhar, not only for sand piles, and uh, non, uh, sorry, abelian sand piles, whatever that is, but also for real things like proteins, right? And this is a paper that GK explained to me long ago saying that, you know, how the collaboration was so exciting that when they took the data to Deepak that he sort of cleaned up the whole stuff and said, this is the essential thing that we must look at. And then they wrote this celebrated paper in PNES. So this is, I think, something that we ought to preserve uh, no matter how big we grow, the fact that people can come together and do things across departments, across expertise, uh, you know, areas and so on. So sim simultaneously with the chemists, uh, the physicists were not to be left behind. So solid state electronics, as it was known at that time, uh, Arvind Vengulekar, Venu, uh, sorry, Gopal and Prabhu, who is now, Prabhu, where are you? Yeah, right here. <laughs> So he's in the front seat. Okay, good. So Prabhu beaming there, and now Gopal has moved on to new things, bigger things, but he still does a lot of research here. Um, so this is about, you know, you're talking about dynamics and molecules, but around the 80s, everybody was looking at semiconductors. In fact, I recall Jagdeep Shah from IBM used to come regularly here, and there was a very active collaboration with IBM on understanding the basic decay processes in a semiconductor. And this is about, you know, quantum wells or barriers in semiconductors. How fast do these particles move? Very crucial for electronics, making devices of all sorts. And that happened in TIFR. Using, um, and this 
particles called excitons. So all of us know what excitons are. But the dynamics of excitons is a problem that really interested a lot of semiconductor physicists, continues to interest them for a long, you know, for as long as these uh, semiconductors have existed. And the first uh, studies of these dynamics were actually, these are among the first that were done. And very proud to say that, you know, this paper appeared. It used to be very difficult to get into PRL those days. But this is one of those papers that managed to break through the barriers. And a very great piece of work. And while investigating dynamics, of course, there was another revolution that was going on. Uh, condensed matter has benefited from fabrication technologies that were made, that were evolved, that were built, uh, developed for making very smaller scale devices, nanoscale and microscale devices. And now these fabrication techniques, as we realize, have led to lots of new materials. For example, the whole field of metamaterials, which is negative refractive index, uh, or the ability that you can shape refractive index profiles the way you want has all happened because of this, the fact that you can take those fabrication techniques from the industry and implement them to make new materials in the lab. Look at this, this, this so many papers all done at TIFR. So this is the kind of the power of the fabrication technologies. And I'm happy to say that TIFR managed to keep pace with time. And I think we have very good fabrication, the nanofab as it's called. And I believe it should be raised to the next level by the time the next plan comes up. So I'm encouraging them to go for a state-of-the-art machine that can keep up this lead. So high-profile papers, again, uh, driven by Gopal and collaborators um, about magneto-optical effects in uh, plasmonic crystals. Plasmonic crystals are, again, a class of materials uh, which are built by this nanotechnology uh, fabrication processes. And the fact, more details, of course, you can talk to the experts, but just applying very, very small magnetic fields, um, Gopal and Co showed that you can actually have enhanced transmission um, through these structures. So these structures have dispersion relations, they have gaps, they have all sorts of things that you can talk to um, the experts about. But the fact that you can control these properties by structure and applying small external fields is something very, very exciting. And that is continuing to be pushed by uh, these groups here. And uh, Prabhu comes back from a postdoc and changes whole direction. He was earlier looking at dynamics. Now he decides to enter to bloom the terahertz desert. And the blooming happened right in the C block second floor. You know, that's where the seeds were uh, you know, planted. And I'm glad to say that he has made tremendous advances not only uh, here, but is also helping lots of labs around the country to develop terahertz technologies. And these are devices where I believe he's also helping the country in interesting and important ways, uh, where he makes these devices on a small scale, large arrays of them to produce a large amount of terahertz power and for various applications, both in um, basic science, in strategic areas, and so on and so forth. So all power to him and more terahertz as he moves on. And simultaneously, uh, Arnab uh, entered late 90s and he pushed the electronic, opto electronic systems. I will not talk much about it, probably because Aroraji might say things. Uh, but these were again uh, devices or uh, materials which are extremely important for semiconductor, opto electronics, lasers, and so on and so forth. So this is again fantastic work. And the last thing, uh, when gallium nitrate became very popular, and I think TIFR was very quickly on that. And they also made several interesting gallium nitride uh, devices, the blue diode lasers. So let's come to, that was all about dynamics and spectroscopy and stuff like that. Now, back to chemistry, Sudipto 1998, he enters. And Sudipto has done, as I said, Robin Hoekstra, so who was in that 1987 picture, was his uh, PhD advisor. And he's for Cornell, he goes to Cornell for a postdoc works with a guy called W.W. W. Webb, right? <laughs> it's true, please Google, I'm not joking. What Webb is the short name? So what Webb, I do not know, but Sudipto at Cornell, along with Webb, pioneered the multi-photon spectroscopy. I think just at the time it was happening, he happened to be there, and they wrote one of those seminal papers in science on this multi-photon spectroscopy. And he comes here, uh, partly I am to blame because I championed TIFR and I don't know he still whether he he blames me for it, but I don't think so. He has done very well here. So Sudipto and Co 
use this multiphoton microscopy to great use. I mean, you know, he used it to, to such a, a striking effect that he actually imaged the serotonin and dopamine in neuronal cells and built India's first multi-photon microscope just about four years after he came um, in 2002, right? So that's just something that is dramatic. He can now image uh, these things in inside cells, you know, the concentrations of these things using multi-photon microscopy. And that has several advantages. It breaks through several barriers. And um, so I had something else. Yeah, so high resolution imaging. And then he also works on a very interesting problem, this Alzheimer's, which is supposed to be in my uh, limited understanding. It's because of protein aggregation in the brain. So he actually um, has been investigating this for a long time, looking at aggregation, how this aggregation ha happens, what, how do you sense where this aggregation is happening and so on. And again, wonderful collaboration across NMR, uh, laser, you know, multiphoton imaging, and so on and so forth. And a very powerful paper came in Angavant Chemi uh, that really made a mark for itself. He also made devices like Prabhu. He is also helping other people in India build up these devices. In fact, as Professor Hosu said yesterday, he conducts regular workshops where people come here. All the materials are provided. He knows where to bring all these the items from, the components from. And they build and they take these microscopes back. The fluorescence correlation uh, microscopes are actually, uh, spectrometers are taken to individual labs after this workshop is held. And he helps them beyond that to see uh, what kind of, you know, if they have any problem and so on. So he has spread the fluorescence correlation spectrometry widely in this country. I'll have a, a little thing to say about the device that you're seeing here shortly. So designing drugs, so more of the same, uh, using these tools to great effect to design drugs now. So all using single molecule techniques. And uh, Jyotish Das Gupta, 10 years later, enters and now takes it in a different direction. He starts looking at solar energy uh, uh, conversion, not in the sense of uh, at a applied level, but at a very basic level, controlling the molecular processes so that you can enhance the conversion of photons to electrons. Uh, Professor Husser again stole the thunder. This is what I was saying. He stole here also. So he explained how the excitation gets carried, more electrons are generated. You can modify the molecules, whatever you want. And so this is a, a uh, the lab that he has built. He did several other things, uh, very high impact work again in uh, science advances, nature communications, what have you, uh, but more details JD can answer. So, um, well, not to be left behind, you know, again in the 90s, laser cooling started in the 80s and people were excited when Bell Labs, people got the first prize for laser cooling, Stephen Chu and others. And then soon in 95, the worst Einstein condensate was made. And there was a lot of thing. Why is TFR not doing anything? And well, TFR did a little later, but well caught up, I must say, um, that this is how, you know, lasers are, these are continuous wave lasers, small diode lasers used to stop atoms in their tracks. And so you use multiple lasers to stop them in all the, in the 3D. And uh, you can also cool them. You can trap them. Everybody knows this stuff now. And uh, the first experiments were started by Uni. And here you can see the cold atoms hitting a surface and sort of bouncing off. Uh, this is Ashok Mahapatra was a student who worked very hard to uh, you know, get these experiments going. And he also made the Bose-Einstein condensate a little later, uh, which, was, uh, which attracted quite a bit of attention. That's a lab that you can see on the right-hand side. And so it was also uh, covered in popular press. And uh, of late, Five years ago, in DNAP, Saurabh Bhatta entered, and he wants to now make cold molecules. And in fact, I think he was one of the first people to make this alkali uh, dimers, you know, sodium, rubidium kind of molecules in the US, where he actually started this work from scratch in that lab, uh, at, uh, in, in the US lab. And now he has come here, and he's very busy setting up these cold molecules, which can have applications in basic physics, not just fundamental interactions among atoms but also in quantum technologies. That's something that Spenta said we should be entering very soon. So um, another thing, and this is how TFR typically grows, that uh, we said we're doing lots of optics, but around that time in the 90s, random lasing became a big thing. And Sushil had done very interesting work at RRI with Hema Ramchandran at, 
um, you know, as his advisor. He went on to do very striking work with Adelag, uh, with uh, uh, Biersma in, uh, I think, somewhere in, in Germany. And he came here in 2006. He started looking at nanoscope, mesoscopic optics, you know, lots of micro particles in a liquid and you shine light and the randomness so the multiple scattering leads to very, very interesting effects. It can trap the light. It can also amplify light, which is called random lasing in because of the feedback from each of these scattering events. And uh, Sushil, uh, the good thing about this is that this is a disordered system, which mimics several things in condensed matter in disordered solids. Like for example, Anderson localization can be easily uh, seen or analogs of that, or that can be checked what happens in disordered solid, which is very difficult to see, can be easily seen in an optical system like this. And so he made some very interesting advances in Anderson localization showing the parallels and so on. Uh, more details you can ask him. And also something about the statistics of, you know, how this, if you look at correlations of this light, um, how these statistics are influenced by how they look similar to what is called Levy statistics or bird flight statistics in my crude understanding. Um, so this is also something that I think I've seen other people mention this in several conferences saying this work was done first at TIFR. So it's a very, very uh, proud thing for uh, TFR to have this. More recently in uh, systems where this is an experiment, I think in the terahertz region, where they're actually trying to control or look at transmission through the uh, waveguide uh, and how this is facilitated by the structure that you have and what Anderson localization does to this, this anomalous transmission. Okay, so a little bit, five minutes to, so I'm not taking too much about myself. But this is a story of high light intensities, um, extreme optics. So we began with normal optics. Now we'll go to nonlinear optics and extreme optics. So all of us know that if you crunch laser uh, power into a short duration, you can enhance what is called the peak power. So one joule in one nanosecond gives you one gigawatt. And uh, we bought, when I came here in 92, uh, the first laser that we bought, we decided that we should enter this field of high intensity interactions with molecules and so on. So we made a 35 picosecond laser, NDR laser. And you can see the laser is here focused by a lens, a green second harmonic of the 1064. And if you can see from the front, I don't know about the back, that you can actually see that there's a spark here caused by uh, the focused light. So the nitrogen and oxygen at the focus are actually ionized by this, producing the spark here. And that's a group, uh, can you recognize them? Well, much younger, Ravindra Kumar and Deepak Mathur. And I'm also glad to see Riju has come to this meeting. Riju Isaac, who was a postdoc here. Riju promised to come, but he has not come. That's next to him. And uh, so on and so forth. So this is the story of electrons being pulled far from their equilibrium positions, not just gentle perturbations like in linear optics, but far from their equilibrium positions, making the motions unharmonic. And uh, this leads to all sorts of things. And I just want to present one result, uh, which is that, you know, small amount of light is transmitted to an observer. But if you shine large amounts of light, it just soaks up. It sort of, you know, builds appetite depending on the intensity of light. And this is what is called optical limiter. It's useful in various contexts. For example, you want, you can just clamp off the light at a certain intensity. Uh, so eye, eye goggles, you know, uh, for laser safety can be made using these materials. And we looked at several other effects like this, but uh, this is just one uh, subset that uh, we did in our lab. And this is to show that in my earlier avatar, I used to work on gigantic molecules, um, like this is tetrathylyl porphyrin. And I'm glad to see that Prem Kiran, who was my postdoc at that time in the early, in the late nineties, he is here in the audience. And this is the work that was done by him, where we showed that small amounts of light, you have linear transmission, but if you have large amounts of light, it actually gets clamped and the excess light is absorbed. So moving to its extremes. So this is about, uh, as we kept moving from 10 to the nine watts per centimeter square to 12 watts per centimeter square, we investigated molecules, M. Krishnamurti, much younger, right? Also much younger here. And Deepak Mathu has moved on, uh, in 2017, he retired from here. And single molecules, clusters, what have you. And very nice results were got from uh, these interactions and about dissociation, ionization, and how these processes happen. 
So then we escalated further. We went to, you know, we became hungry for power in a way. So 100 terawatts from 2 gigawatts in 93 to 150 terawatts in 2019 and beyond. Um, so this is a 100 terawatt laser that we had from 2010, producing 10 to the 19 watts per centimeter square, which is four, three orders of magnitude larger than the electric field corresponding intensity between the hydrogen nucleus and the electron. So that is 10 to the 16, this is 10 to the 19. So obviously, also these are laser like that. These are the people who invented Gerard Muro and Donna Strickland, who was a graduate student with Muro. Muro visited us in 2009, nine years before he got the Nobel Prize. And nice picture. So it's me there and uh, MK, Amit, and Raji, who was a graduate student at that time. And so there's a story of extreme light where we bring in this powerful light and uh, explode the solid, create extreme levels of excitation in a very, very short time frame of 30 femtoseconds or so. I will finish shortly. And you create all sorts of things. You know, this, this is a story of literally what happens inside stars on a tabletop. So you produce relativistic electrons from one EV photons. You produce huge amount of ionization. So you have a plasma, which is like what is inside a star, some part of a star. And you have secondary. So these are sorts of rich secondary emissions, ionized particles, free electrons at MeV energies. And you have terahertz radiation coming from here. You have uh, huge magnetic fields that have been set up because of these fast electron currents, which are of the order of mega ampere pulses. I don't have all the time in the world to describe. I just want to show you that the magnetic field that we measured here, flashing on the left-hand side, changing very rapidly, both in space and time. Uh, if you take a power spectrum of that, that actually looks like a, you know, that has a nice scaling law on the right-hand side. And this mimics the astrophysical turbulence, what happens inside the sun and uh, various other stellar environments. So this is what is called turbulent tabletops and nature uh, physics wrote a highlight and called it, they rejected the paper, but they wrote the highlight saying that it is probably a mini solar system in the lab. That's the underlying uh, statement there. And then we pursued this further looking at this mega ampere electron uh, dynamics and several other results came out about their transport inside nanotubes, uh, inside bulk solids and so on. And MK made the world's first neutral atom accelerator. So neutral atoms, Pillay talked about charged particles. This is neutral atoms at MeV being produced only in TIFR, nowhere else, right? And um, people say that, how do you do this? So it's by ionization and subsequent recombination, leaving the energy intact, but neutralizing the charge. So this is the world's first, very proud of this achievement. And we also did several things in collaboration with Pusha Nayub and, uh, you know, you can see um, other condensed matter colleagues elsewhere, where we push the plasmas to emit brighter and brighter X-ray emission. And an accidental discovery was the fact that we started competing with Prabhu. He produces nanojoules and picojoules. We said, we just put a liquid in the laser and now we're getting microjoules. Well, it was an accidental discovery because we were just testing out something else and suddenly we saw terahertz emission coming. This again became very uh, noted. And in the last two minutes, Vandana, sorry about this, uh, is that the world became, now it's getting global. Uh, we now have an extreme photonics innovation center in, uh, in TIFR, presently, you know, actively being pursued at the Hyderabad campus, uh, where uh, UK has invested 4 million pounds. Um, we are producing, we are providing the sort of in-kind contribution by our expertise, facilities here and so on. The thing is to generate technologies for the next generation high rep rate lasers. And I'm glad Rajiv is in the audience. I hope he has come for this meeting. Uh, he has been the main uh, a driver behind this collaboration. So extremes in future move to Hyderabad, where we have lots of space and we'll put a petawatt laser, hopefully by 2024, uh, if the bureaucracy can be overcome, they have a lot of stopping power. <laughs> so this is a lab that's being built in Hope, a huge hangar. It looks like a Boeing hangar. Please go and take a look before it becomes an enclosed lab. It's really nice to walk in and admire, oh my God, how big it is. It's probably much larger than this auditorium, right? So uh, we will do everything under the sun from astro to accelerator to condensed matter physics, warm condensed matter physics, and even QED. That's what we promise. How much we'll deliver the next 25, 75 years, we'll tell you. And uh, so um, research at TRFR itself, 
is probably it's you know too presumptuous to say because who expected all these things to happen? People come together, things happen, and then people move on to do different things. Um, some areas of immediate expansion that we are thinking of is tremendous amount in quantum technologies because optics is where quantum technologies are very easily doable. Um, and basic physics uh, in all these quantum areas, I do second physics, which has been a dream for about 10 years, uh, has not happened, but should happen. Precision quantum optics, again, TIFR is for fundamental research, so that, and unheard of so far, but we are probably moving in different directions. We are thinking of a Section 8 company to commercialize things that people like Sudip to build and several others, maybe terahertz devices also for the country, right? And startups. So maybe many of the future people can have startups. In fact, they're already asking, thirsting for, I want to start a company. I want to start a company. How can I do that? Several young people are rooting for this. So they will happen. So you'll see things changing dramatically. And so now if I tell you this, have I covered on this? Perhaps I have. There are you know, high intensity lasers, uh, basic aspects of light, light propagation on the right-hand side, high energy density science, tweezers, cooled atoms, I guess I have given you a flavor of all this. And uh, so you say that, you no, know, fundamentals to extremes. What a title. You start from fundamentals, you move to extremes. But extremes, again, reveal fundamentals to you, right? So this is a cycle that keeps repeating endlessly. And uh, thanks to all the people who shared the slides with me. And also to these uh, nice students who made the slides, uh, the interesting slides of this talk. And if you still have a little bit of appetite, one more, just one more minute. Sorry to be eating into a tea break, but this is probably worth it. So you're not coming to the lab, so I have brought the lab here. So something for the TFR people, this is, um, come on, you've shown this before. So please close your eyes. The rest of you, look at our 100 terawatt laser beam, which is shown on this red paper blinking away. And flash is a spot at the very beginning. This is the laser beam. You can see it moving at seven centimeters or so, almost half of my hand. So the lasers become bigger in, in physical size as they become higher in power. And uh, so now let's go and see. We focus it. We move the red shutter going up, and it falls on a target. Now can we have louder sound, please? So this is literally ending with a bang for you. So that's the first second point. Not very high power because it's happening in there. So very low power being focused on a target and creating power there. And if I continue, I'll show you a close-up of that also. Increase the sound again, please. So you can see that the, the target which is there, you have a plasma blooming out, and you hear sound, which is actually the shock wave caused by the rapid explosion of the plasma from where this has been irradiated. So this is a sound and light show that we have routinely in our lab when we are aligning target. And I thought I'd just bring a little bit of that to you. So uh, no, these are in vacuum, this is air. The intensity is low. Uh, in vacuum, when you go beyond 10 to the 14, you cannot have these pulses propagating in air because they cause lightning. So we also done those experiments where the light pulse actually causes, it streaks in the air, causing, a, you know, you can see lightning happening in air. And so that's what is called filamentation, right? So thank you so much and uh, apologies to the chair and other people. All of you for overstepping. Thank you, Ravi, and uh, thank you.